Hi, and welcome to the Integumentary System Lab Screencast. Uh, this lab, I think, is going to be relatively straightforward. Let's just dive right in. Uh, we will start here on the modules page, because this is where we land every day. Um, so we've got our lab here and our lab report here. Uh, as you will probably know by now, there's a link to your lab report on the lab system page, um, but you can also just come here directly for it. And this week I was nice enough to give you my version of what the lab report would look like because um, there's a couple things you're probably not going to be sure how you should fill out. And it's okay if you struggle with it. I will not grade your lab report for accuracy as long as you have filled it all in. And then on Sunday, after you have turned your lab report in on Monday, you'll be able to open this document, but not till Sunday. Um, so let's just dive right in. If you click on that, boom, you get this. Um, I have, as I've been doing, um, put your learning objectives from the lab guide here, but really you just want to click on your lab guide, which should open, not that one, something that looks like this. Um, so you have a list of organs for the integumentary system that you are going to have to be able to identify on a model or under the microscope. The definitive list of structures, organs, whatever you want to call them, that you want to know is here. If it's in this table, you need to be able to find it, either on the model or under the scope, or excuse me, either on the model or both on the model and under the scope. And we'll go over which is what. Um, but these are all of the things that you want to be able to identify and then fill out this table, what's their function, where are they located, and what is their tissue type. Um, we'll go over a lot of that material, but it is all already listed in your integumentary system lab guide. Um, so first up then, just what's on this model? You have, um, sorry, and I hope I'm not scrolling through things too fast. You have this image here which has everything on your list that you need to know. You might see this image for the quiz later. And then I have um, stolen this image from Practice Anatomy Lab. Um, and you will want to use Practice Anatomy Lab to practice this stuff because what's going to be on your lab exam is going to be a model very similar to this one, but not this one. So you want to get familiar with what all of these structures look like. So I have everything that you might see on a quiz or the lab exam labeled here, and then it's also labeled in that picture up the top. So let's go back to that very first picture then, and just go over the things that you need to know, starting most generally. Um, you can divide the skin between these three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. Um, the epidermis, you want to be able to identify it um, on the model, on the scope, and you need to know what tissue type it is. That's listed up here. It's simple, excuse me, stratified squamous epithelium. Then your dermis um, is technically composed of two layers. If we scroll down to get the dermis, um, there's a papillary layer and a reticular layer. 90% of the thickness of the dermis is this reticular layer, so that's the one that we care about. So for us, as far as we are concerned, the dermis is made out of dense, irregular connective tissue. Hopefully you remember this from chapter 4. Hey, just for fun, let's go back to chapter 4. Um, where'd our connective tissue go? Right here was dense, irregular connective tissue, and we said this stuff right here, the dermis, is a fine example of dense, irregular connective tissue. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to skip around quite this much. but So we're still working our way through um, epidermis, dermis, 
hypodermis. I'm just going to write next to it here. You want to know, whoops, ADI. This is supposed to say adipose tissue. Um, so the hypodermis is primarily composed of adipose tissue. Then within the dermis, um, you have a number of structures that you want to be able to identify. Um, first up, let's do the, I don't know what we want to do first. Um, let's start with our sensory structures. You have a Pacinian corpuscle. On your list, that is referred to as lamellar. I'm sorry, I think there's supposed to be just one L there, lamellar corpuscle, and you can go down and read about it. It is for pressure or vibration. So because it is um, somewhat far removed from the surface of the skin, a relative um, higher amount of pressure is required to activate this corpuscle. Um, and then vibrations as well, because vibrations just travel very well. There is another corpuscle that you cannot see on this model or in this picture. It would be located right about here, and it would probably be a little bit smaller than that. Um, but it would look like kind of a mitochondria attached to one of these axons. If you scroll to the picture I gave you of the model, don't want to lose anybody, that's a Meisner's corpuscle right there. There's your uh, Pacinian or lamellar corpuscle. Um, so much, much smaller. Something to keep in mind when you're looking at them under the microscope, which you will have to do. Um, and let's just, if we're annotating things and having fun, right, we are, I've already called it Meisner's. This is the old term. Um, the new term is tactile. That's supposed to be T-A-C-T-I-L-E, tactile corpuscle. Um, we are moving away from naming things after people for two reasons. One, it's just kind of fallen out of favor, and it's not a very scientific way of naming things. And two, there's no way to really prove that Meisner was the first person to look at a Meisner's corpuscle. Um, and so it just, um, I think, taking people's names out of it removes the focus of science um, from who did it to just what it is, um, which is better. Uh, let's see, so we did Pacinian corpuscle or lamellar corpuscle, pressure vibration, Meisner's or tactile corpuscle is for light touch. Um, then you have, let's say, your whole hair follicle here, um, which contains the hair, um, both shaft and root. I don't care if you know the difference between the two, and they're not on your list, so it doesn't matter. Um, so the hair follicle produces the hair. Um, attached to the hair follicle are sebaceous glands right there. Um, you can read what they do. They produce an oily substance called sebum, which moisturizes the surface of your skin. So it prevents cracking, which is a way of preventing infections in your skin. And then also there are some antimicrobial um, chemicals in the sebum that reduce the growth of bacteria on your skin. Then surrounding your hair follicle here is what is called the hair follicle receptor. Um, I believe in your um, lab report it might be called the hair root plexus. Um, but either one, hair follicle receptor hair root plexus. This lets you know when the hair follicle has been disturbed and that gets disturbed when something is crawling on the surface of your skin. So it lets you know when your hairs have been bent back or not. Um, then let's see you have your erector pili muscle here which is connected to the follicle. When it contracts it's gonna pull 
the hair in that direction, or excuse me, the follicle in that direction, and then your hairs are going to stand straight up on end. So this is where your goosebumps come from. Um, probably not physiologically very important in humans, but in animals that still, or not still, in animals that regulate their body temperature by raising and lowering the fur or hair on their coat, the erector pili muscles are what do that and, and play an important role in um, thermoregulation. But they're just kind of evolutionary leftovers for us. Uh, then you have, lastly, your eccrine sweat gland. Um, I don't care that you remember it's an eccrine sweat gland, just call it a sweat gland. If I go to the model, let me move real quick. Here they have a different kind of sweat gland called sudoriferous, and then these little white jobs, those are the eccrine sweat gland. Uh, sudoriferous is sometimes also called apocrine gland. These are the ones that are found in your armpit and anogenital region uh, that are responsible for producing the substances that eventually are going to give rise to your bodily odor. Uh, but these little white ones here and that sucker right there, they just produce regular old sweat. Um, so mostly water with enough salt to generate an osmotic gradient so that water actually gets pulled out of your body. And the job of the eccrine sweat gland is thermoregulation. Um, what haven't we covered yet? Uh, the only thing we haven't talked about, um, and I'll do it now just so I don't forget, because um, we're going to kind of sort of skip around a bit, um, on your list of things to know is melanin. As you learn about the epidermis or read about it, you'll see that all of the different cell types in the epidermis are listed. You do not need to know for lab all the different cell types of the epidermis. You also do not need to know all the different layers of the epidermis. However, you do need to know that one of these cell types, the melanocyte, produces a pigment called melanin. And the job of melanin is to block harmful UV radiation. So the way it works, if we skip all the way down here, is here's your melanocyte. It is where the melanin is produced, but where most of the melanin accumulates is one layer up in what is called the stratum spinosum. So what this does is form a shade layer over what is called the stratum basale, this layer down here. The stratum basale is where mitosis takes place. Those are the cells that keep dividing, so when these cells up here die and fall off, they're going to eventually be replaced by a cell that was made down here. And you want to protect the mitotically active cells from DNA damage, because if you have DNA damage and you pass that DNA damage, onto your progeny, then you can pass mutations onto progeny, um, and that is what leads to cancer. Um, so if a cell that's never going to divide develops a few mutations, it's probably not going to change anything. But if dividing cells start developing mutations, then you've got problems, because now you're repeating those mutations over and over again. Um, so the role of melanin is not to be a pigment. The pigment exists right, so that the cells underneath it can be protected from UV radiation that would then cause DNA damage. So that is just your sort of general overview. I do want to go over what this all looks like under the microscope. So you have like this picture of epidermis and all of these other pictures um, that can be used to help you study. But I want to give these pictures some, what's the word I'm looking for? Some context. So what you're going to have to be able to identify under the microscope is like 
well, let's let's just look at this picture here. Um, epidermis versus dermis, or in this other picture down here, this is the epidermis. It's a thinner epidermis, and then this is the dermis. You want to be able to identify tactile corpuscles or Meisner's corpuscles versus lamellar corpuscles or um, Pacinian corpuscles. I will point out this is not skin. This is actually a sample of pancreas. Um, then, also under the microscope, you want to be able to tell the difference between a sebaceous gland here attached to a hair follicle or an eccrine sweat gland as shown here or a sebaceous gland as shown here. Um, while we're talking about these two glands, you also want to know whether they are endocrine or exocrine glands. So if we go back to chapter 4 again, wrong chapter, here's chapter 4, when we were talking about um, different kinds of glands as they relate to epithelia, because glands are derived from epithelial tissue, um, we said there were endocrine glands and exocrine glands. Um, an endocrine gland in this rather goofy picture is just this collection of cells, that collection of cells, and that collection of cells. So it's a group of cells inside the body that have a good blood supply, and they release things, usually hormones, into the bloodstream. Um, they do not have a duct. There isn't a pore that all of these cells dump their secretion into. With a sweat gland, which this looks very much like a sweat gland, all the sweat gets dumped into a pore. The pore leads to the surface of the body. So anatomically, exocrine glands um, have a duct to them. And then, sort of functionally speaking, their secretion ends up outside the body. So if we go back and look at um, here, our sebaceous gland, it is connected to the hair follicle. The hair follicle has a hair in it which protrudes up to the surface of the body. So the secretions from the sebaceous gland are going to get dumped into a duct. You just can't see it here. Um, and eventually they're going to make their way out of the body. And then if you look at the sweat gland here, you can see there are holes there. Um, so this is sort of like a sweat gland is like a, a plate full of hollow noodles. And if you cut it in cross section, that's what it looks like. Um, but each one of these is going to, well, not each one of these. This is just one big, long, hollow noodle that is eventually going to find its way to the surface. Over here on this same slide, and it looks different because this is scalp, and the slides we have for scalp just stain different. This is an eccrine sweat gland. Um, so, well, let me just move on. Uh, this is not quite as organized as I wanted it to be, but teaching it online for the first time, so we're, we're going to go with what we have. Um, so before we get to the lab report, I wanted to finish up doing the overview by showing you what's available to you in my lab and mastering in the study area or practice anatomy lab. So go to my lab and mastering, open my lab and mastering, launch the study area. We'll click on the study area, launch the study area. Uh, and then again, for this week, you want to spend some time um, learning the material in practice anatomy lab. Uh, so you click on that, then you have to click on it again. Then over here, um, if you want to do the skin model, you click on anatomical models, integumentary system. And hey, look, there's that picture that we just saw. Um, you can mouse over it and the different parts will show up or you can turn labels on and off. Um, so familiarize yourself with that model. You can quiz yourself on it. You can take a practical, which it'll ask you like every question. The only thing, for reasons I can't fathom, I, I don't understand, um, the eccrine sweat gland, this little white thing, is not labeled. Um, 
Then what I really wanted to show you is if we go to histology and say, whoops, first system, integumentary system, then we have these lovely images. Can I move this whole thing over there? Um, so, oh, I hate that it does that. I don't always want the highlight thingy. Um, so this is full thickness through skin. This is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Lower magnification than we would be able to get on our microscopes. Um, so our microscopes, if we were to if you were to use them in lab would go as low as 40 times magnification. This is probably four or 10 times magnification. So down here, this is all hypodermis, right? It looks mostly like adipose tissue. That onion looking thingy right there, that's your lamellar or pacinian corpuscle. And then you can also see within your hypodermis there and there and some other places, but it's only highlighted there. Um, can I do it? No, I can't do it with that, can I? Nope, sorry. Uh, I'm trying to mouse over some of the other sweat glands, but that part is sweat gland, that little bit there is a sweat gland, that's part of a sweat gland, this is all part of a sweat gland. Um, so those are the eccrine glands, one place to see them. Then all of that, as it says up there, which was just highlighted. That's all dermis, dense irregular connective tissue, and then that part is epidermis. And you'll note that it's darker, right? So the epidermis is all cells, highly cellular. Each cell has a nucleus. The nucleus is the darkest part of any cell because the DNA is very dense, Hence, it stains darker. This is why chromosomes are called chromosomes, because chromosomes means colored body. Um, so whenever you're looking at a tissue, the darker it is, chances are it's got more cells. Excuse me, yeah, more cells. And if it's lighter, fewer cells. So most of the pink that you're seeing there on dermis, that's all collagen fibers that have just stained pink. So not a ton of cells in the dermis. Uh, then if you just move in a little bit closer, you can see again your dermis and your epidermis. Um, I don't know if they're going to label that. They're not, but this little, there we go. Um, that little bit right there and that thing over there as well, those are ducts of eccrine sweat glands. Uh, I don't remember what else I wanted to point out, um, but just know dermis, epidermis, again, for studying for the lab practical when we're going to give you microscopic images and ask you to identify epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Um, this region, there it is, that's the papillary layer of your dermis, which we don't really talk about, um, but this is where your tactile or Meisner's corpuscles are located. So when we see one later, know that this is where it is. Um, and on the lab exam, if we're asking for something located in this papillary layer, but you can't tell what it is, you just know it's a tactile corpuscle because that's what's supposed to be um, found there. What else are they showing us? Again, there's a lamellar corpuscle and that's a sweat gland. If you look real close, you can make out it's kind of stratified cuboidal epithelium. Um, it's two layers of cuboidal epithelia that make up your sweat glands. And there's some cool other stuff down here. This is a nice blood vessel, and there's another blood vessel there. Uh, let's see, what else do we want to point out? Then, zooming in, um, this is thick skin. We are not going to go over in this class the difference between thin and thick skin, but I do feel as though I should point it out. Um, so just to orient us, uh, whoops, this stratum basale, that is the bottom layer or the deep layer of the epidermis, and then it's spinosum, granulosum, lucidum, and stratum corneum. The stratum corneum is... So this big thick layer here, that's all dead skin cells. And that's the difference between thick skin and thin skin. 
in thin skin, you are not going to have a pronounced stratum corneum. In thick skin, you will. Uh, the other thing to point out, that sucker right there is your Meisner's corpuscle or tactile corpuscle. Um, and if you just look here, that looks different than that. I think it looks like a little mitochondria. Um, that's probably another one right there. That's almost certainly another one right there. It's just not labeled. Um, so there's a Meisner's corpuscle. Um, don't forget to familiarize yourself with that. Um, what else? This is just a close-up of the dermis. We don't care. Um, again, this is thick skin, prominent. Um, let me get away from that. Uh, this whole get away from here to there, that part. Very prominent stratum corneum. Uh, I like this one because it shows us the basement membrane. If you recall, all of your epithelia are sitting on top of a basement membrane. So here's your epithelium, and that's where the basement membrane that supports the epithelium is supposed to be. Um, when we have our, or when we talk about our skin cancer case study, right, skin cancer is going to start somewhere in the epithelium and has to pass through the basement membrane before it can get down into the dermis. So it has to develop the physiological capability of enzymatically digesting the basement membrane. And that is what it means when a cancer becomes invasive or when it spreads, it actually accumulates new skills. Um, there's a sweat gland, not a beautiful version of one, but you can see it's round nuclei, so you assume kind of cuboidal shaped cells with a pore in the middle, so it's a sweat gland. And then all of this around it, if you look, right, there's a nucleus, there's a couple, and a couple there. But there's not a whole lot of nuclei here. So this is mostly just extracellular matrix, thick collagen fibers that are running in various directions. Uh, let me see, let me just make sure if there's other things I want to point out. There's another Meissner's corpuscle, lamellar corpuscle, Hair follicles, if you want to look, I'm not going to spend time on that. Uh, let me just go back real quick. Um, you don't need to know the difference between thick skin and thin skin, but if you look here at the epidermis, um, what is highlighted is mostly up to stratum uh, granulosum, and then there's just this loose stuff up top that's flaking off, that's your stratum corneum. Um, so a very thin stratum corneum on the thin skin. What else did we want to do? This is all hair follicles. There's nothing important here. Um, here's another example of a sebaceous gland. Um, so when you're doing sebaceous versus sweat glands, if you're looking under the microscope and we're asking you what kind of tissue it is and you don't know what it is, if you see a hair follicle um, and some collection of roundish looking cells next to it, it's a sebaceous gland. Um, the other big difference between a sebaceous gland and a sweat gland is that when you look at the sebaceous gland, you don't see a pore in the middle of it, uh, right? There is the lumen of the hair follicle is the duct into which the sebum is going to be secreted so this gland does have a duct, but when you look at it, you don't see it. So for a sebaceous gland, I think the cells look bigger than the sweat gland cells. They generally don't stain as dark um, because they're bigger, um, and the cytoplasm doesn't look dark, whereas with the sweat gland, the cells are all smaller, the nuclei are packed closer together, and the nuclei make the gland look dark because the nuclei are dark. Um, and let me see, yeah, like right over there and there, there's a little bit of sweat gland. Um, so here's sebaceous gland, um, very big cells um, with the nuclei spaced out because the cells are really big and they're going to empty into that lumen right there. And then here's just two little sections of a sweat gland with your smaller cuboidal shaped cells but they still have a hole in the middle. 
Um, so because you have a lot of hair on your scalp and you sweat through your scalp a lot for thermoregulation, looking at the scalp is a great place to tell the difference between sweat glands and uh, sebaceous glands. And then this is an example of an animal or person that has a fair amount of pigment. Um, so this I can't, kills me that I can't mouse over it. Um, that brown layer at the bottom of the stratum basale, that is melanin. Um, so that, that's what gives people their skin tone. If you have more melanin, your skin is darker and it is there to protect against UV radiation. We all have it, um, and the, the slides in the lab sometimes say pigmented versus non-pigmented skin, but all skin, unless you're albino, is pigmented, just some people have more than others. Um, I think that is everything I wanted to show you. So you want to spend some time going through all of these to practice finding things under the microscope. Um, and I will review on, let's go back to this figure right here. We're in your, whoops, that's your lab report, um, which surprise, surprise, looks a lot like your lab guide. Um, but let's go through this real quick. Um, so epidermis, model and scope, dermis, model and scope, hypodermis, model and scope, hair follicle, model and scope. Oh, are you noticing a pattern? Uh, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, tactile, lamellar corpuscle, all of those on the model or under the microscope. It's just the erector pili muscles and the root hair plexus or hair follicle receptor they don't show up very well under the microscope, so you won't see them under the microscope. All of this other stuff, be able to identify in the model, um, it's like the picture in the lab guide, the model in the lab guide, which is also the model from Practice Anatomy Lab, or under the microscope. Um, just don't worry about these two here. And also, don't forget to keep this image in mind. I don't know what's going to end up on the practical. Um, a lamellar corpuscle in the pancreas or a lamella, lamellar corpuscle in skin. So keep that in mind. So that is everything you need to know. Pretty straightforward. Um, if you click, sorry, I'm clicking all around. Um, let's go back to our lab. So everything we've done so far is just using the lab guide and I went to our chapter four PowerPoints for a few things and then practice anatomy lab. When you click on the lab report, it just, it's gonna be so easy this week. You click on that, it's gonna look like this. All you've gotta do is fill in this table. That's it, there's no activities for you to do. You don't have to cut up a potato. Um, you don't have to dissect your own skin. I could not think of anything fun for you all to do at home. Um, so fill this table out. These ones that I've X'd out, they're like, I don't know what kind of tissue type melanin is. It's not a tissue. It's a substance. Um, so don't worry about those. Fill in the rest of the table as best you can. Um, if you're not sure what you wrote, what you wrote, what you wrote or typed was correct on Sunday after you've done this, you can go back to the modules page and find under week six um, my lab report and then you'll know what the answers are supposed to be. Um, that's it. Pretty straightforward, easy lab this week. Um, so your lab quiz next week will be a mixture of images of either the cartoon image of the skin or the model of the skin with a few um, microscopic images as well, not a lot, but one or two thrown in there, um, and then functional follow-up questions as well. So there'll be a little bit of what is this structure, what is that structure, and a little bit of what does this structure do, what does that structure do, where is this structure located. Um, but if you know all the information in that table and you can identify everything, you should be in good shape. Um, and I think that's it. 
I'm going to let you go. Yeah, the last thing I will just say, on the exam, it is going to be pictures of a skin model, very similar to the one that you've seen, but not the same exact model, um, and microscopic images, very similar to what is in the lab guide and what is up on Practice Anatomy Lab. So if you know the model and you know the slide images, you will be in good shape for the lab exam.